Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is our Immunity Matters show. And today we're going to talk about uh, national news and how national news is taking the oxygen out of local news, which is very important to us and into our democracy. And what, what can we do about this process? We're going to talk to uh, Brett Obergaard, and he's the program director of the journalism program at UH Manoa. Welcome to the show, Brett. Nice to see you here. Thanks for having me back, Jay. Always enjoy it. Let's talk about, let's start looking at local news first. You know, I was somewhat disturbed to see that the Star Advertiser might be sold, or if not sold, it might close. Um, what does that tell us? What's the state of affairs, the state of the press, if you will, in Honolulu, in Hawaii? Well, there's there's definitely a collapse of the newspaper economic model, and I think the Star Advertiser reflects that. But if if you were living in any other city in the country or in lots of any other town, uh, you would probably see similar impacts on your local printed newspaper. And it's uh, it's a real real crisis of um, uh, the ability to circulate local information. I mean, there's there's a lot of news sources and a lot of people have ways to share information, but how do you get local journalism? That is something that mostly newspapers have been providing for centuries. And with the collapse of their economic model, you're getting fewer and fewer newspapers in wider and wider areas, which is a term called news deserts. Uh, it's basically creating uh, deserts of, of lack of local information. It's not that people are having no information, but they're not getting the local local news anymore. And it's um, it's a scourge to democracy. And I think that's playing out on the national scale. You know, what did Tip O'Neill say? He said, all politics is local. That's not true anymore. Um, but you can still say all news, the news you care about in your community and your life and your home and your family and down the block, that is local. And if local local media fails, something is lost in our in our quality of life. Uh, isn't that true? Can you have a democracy without local news? I absolutely cannot. And then the other part of that is um, we used to believe that all news was local, all politics was local, and there's been an inversion in the last maybe decade or so with the advent of social media where all news has become... Uh, emotional and, um, you know, scintillating and based on how many clicks it can get. And that has created this uh, kind of destruction of the system that we used to have that was, uh, like you said, based on a local foundation. And it's flipped it over into all local politics or national, like do you follow your dear leader or not, and then all local news has become sucked up in these national debates, and and what we're losing out on is a lot of um, really the information that affects you personally every single day. It happens locally. The national parts do affect people, but the every day, all of the government agents working around your whole city, all around your whole county, they're all doing things for you. And if you're not paying attention to that, you're in big trouble. Yeah, and they're doing things for themselves. <laughs> you know, you, you, talked about, <laughs> you talked about, um, you know, the failure of the business model on the local end of things. And one thing that strikes me is that, um, you know, we think of local newspapers as, as paper, as print paper. Uh, we think of the, you know, the news, the news deliverer boy or girl. Um, we think of uh, the, the new stand on the corner and all that. But that whole, you know, physical brick and mortars kind of platform has gone or is going. And so you, you take a perfectly reasonable newspaper and all of a sudden um, it's different. And it has a different, mm, a, a different constituency, a different delivery system, a different appeal to them. Can you talk about that? What do we do without print press? Yeah, there's a couple of parts to it. So the news desert research that academics do focuses mostly on printed newspapers. And it talks about the desert that forms when there's no printed newspapers, and that relates to the local journalists um, in the area. But there are other types of journalists. There are radio journalists, TV journalists. The whole analog system is deteriorating. I mean, if you look at uh, the newsrooms of the local TV stations, 
Um, not so much like HPR because it has a different model and it's actually doing pretty well, but um, it, it, you know, there's there's a there are multiple parts happening at the same time where the newsrooms are shrinking. The analog newspaper might exist even like in Honolulu when you have the Star Advertiser, but the newsrooms are getting smaller and smaller, meaning. Uh, the paper may be there. It may you may be able to tally it as like, yeah, this place has a newspaper, but it's not a real great newspaper. It's not serving the interests of the readers, and and there are lots of problems underneath even that kind of a uh, shell. I I recently was in the um, uh, Olympia, Washington area, and this is the state capital of the state of Washington. In the middle of session, 40, 48 days into session was when I was there. Uh, I picked up the daily newspaper uh, they called The Olympian. I went through it, and there was literally one local story in the entire newspaper during the middle of the legislative session. One story. Out of all, everything in it was wire copy and um, you know, ads and things like that. There was nothing in the in the state's um, capitals newspaper. So, I just I just think there the complexity of it all is um, uh, cr creating this kind of grill that everything's falling through. Like we don't know about so many things, and then there's not uh, enough filling it up yet. Although I do want to talk about some of the promising parts of of how the industry is changing. Yeah, they go being optimistic. <laughs> you know, I, I recently I got a I got an email from the Houston Chronicle, and uh, they had uh, two editorial board opinion pieces that I really liked. Uh, one was they um, endorsed uh, Nikki Haley uh, for the Republican side, and the other is they endorsed uh, Joe Biden for you know the Democratic side. And they were really straight about it. It was very good. It was well researched. You know, you expect that from an editorial board. Um, you expect the best. And I said to myself, "That's that's very interesting." I want to take a look at the rest of the paper. And what was what was interesting, just as you said in Washington, there were a lot of articles about national stories. Now, there the Houston Chronicle is holding on to local stories too, and you know we we should admire them for that. But I agree with you because. People are interested in the national stuff. Um, that's the title of this program, is the national news, national media sucking the oxygen out of the local media. Um, and I think that over time, what, what you saw in Washington is going to be more the case, that they're going to report on the things they think people will want to hear about. And since, uh, you know, the media, the national media is covering, you know, these raw meat stories every day from Washington and beyond, um, that th th they have to follow those those issues, those events, or people won't read them. People don't think that local news is as important at a time when the national media is calling everything a crisis. Your comments? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's um, what vile, disgusting, horrible thing did Trump say today? That's what you first thing you want to know when you wake up in the morning. And then... Um, you know, how is our uh, American democracy about to collapse? That's the second thing. And then at some point you might get down to, well, I wonder what they're doing with Aloha Stadium. That's been closed for four years and they still haven't uh, done anything on this. So, um, you know, not everybody has the capacity to go through a laundry list of um, news concerns that uh, numbers in the 20s or 30s. Sometimes people just like, God, what horrible thing did Trump say today? And how are we going to deal with that? And then that's just like, that takes up all my energy. I'm done. I, I'm going to go take a nap because this is just too much. And I think that is part of what's happening here. We've like revved up these um, machines. And and part of that true, it really is a reflection of how social media um, creates its, its money. This money is made by clicks. It's made by people staying engaged with things and, They've built these systems, and again, they're built systems. They don't have to be built this way. People are making choices, and they've built these systems to latch onto you like a, a hook in your mouth, like you're a fish, and hold onto you for as long as they can. And then when you let go, and another shiny hook comes by and grabs onto you and yanks you into the boat. So these are um, these are these are really uh, 
profound issues I think we need to face as as Americans who value democracy. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm thinking of um, the, the business model which you mentioned. So social media, the money comes into social media from national advertising sources, na national sources. I mean, you know, Joe Dokes and King and and Bishop isn't going to be putting money uh, into those clicks. Um, some national company is going to be putting money into those clicks. Likewise, uh, you know, the national media gets tons and tons and tons and tons of advertising money from national sources, uh, all kinds of national sources. And so there's a kind of consolidation of the sources. Uh, the sources are, are paying into national stories. They're not paying uh, the Houston Chronicle all that much in terms of advertising. Um, so any local paper, I should, media, really has a, has a problem because they're competing with national stories and national media. Therefore, um, the, old, the old model of getting advertising revenue isn't like it was. If they get a local company um, to put some money in for advertising, that's good. But they're not going to get national companies that put it into national media. So you have, um, you know, you have a decline of advertising revenue. And of course, because people don't read those papers, not as much as social media and national media, uh, the paper can't show the advertiser um, the clicks. The paper can't show the advertiser the circulation. And so the whole thing begins to spiral down. Your thoughts? Yeah, there's a big issue with the, just the analytics, like you mentioned. If I have a newspaper like the uh, Star Advertiser, and I say that the circulation is 230,000, including midweek and everything they put out. And then the advertiser asked me 230,000 people, who are these people? And I say, well, I don't know. I just, you know, I print the paper and I put it out there and some people pick it up and they're like, so I'm printing, so I'm paying for a bunch of stuff I don't need. Is that what you're telling me? Well, and, and then they say, and Facebook can, they can, Put me right into the to the lane with somebody who's been clicking on buying a new car. He needs a new car, used cars in Honolulu. You know they can put me right into their account. So that seems to me like a better, and, and you know at, at one tenth of the price, that seems to me like a better deal as the advertisers. I think the fundamental part of that that not very many people talk about is that the advertisers with the newspapers, I think, used to have a. Um, community responsibility, like they cared about their community, even if they weren't necessarily getting a direct benefit. They're like, oh, I care about Honolulu. You know, I live here too. My staff lives here. I care about this place. And then, um, you know, when when that's all disaggregated and, and thrown to just click numbers, then it's it's they don't they don't really feel that responsibility anymore to keep the place going. They just feel like straight line, I want to sell a car, I'm going to sell this to this person, that's all I care about. And then what's lost in between, I think, is, a, is an enormous amount of uh, what makes a community work. Yeah. You know, a couple of thoughts come to mind. Number one is, uh, you know, of course, social media, and for that matter, anything on the internet um, um, is capable of uh, electronic analysis. And AI changes the, 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 the calculus about that because you can do electronic analysis till the cows come home. You can find exactly what sample you want to send this news or advertising to. It's quite remarkable, and, that, and they're picking up on that. The national media and, of course, um, you know, the, the tech companies. But one thing is uh, right now in Congress, um, there is this bill called, uh, what is it, the Journalism Protection Act, uh, which is intended to protect... Um, local media, in large part, uh, from national tech media like um, Google, Facebook, what have you, and the uh, AI, the AI companies, from taking the content out of local media and putting it in their AI large language models, um, so and making a buck that way, and without paying local media anything for it. And um, I don't know if this bill's going to pass. Um, I'm not sure what the testimony has been. You know that um, you know Google, for example, as one of the companies involved, is going to oppose that bill. Um, but at the end of the day, what they're doing is sucking the, the the work product out of the local media, using it for their own 
their own benefit by including it in a large language model without paying them. Thoughts? Well, this goes back to the origin of the internet when um, the World Wide Web uh, was created and newspapers decided. I think it was a sort of, I mean, I, I don't really blame them at that point. It was like, it was sort of a novel, um, sm a small audience on the World Wide Web. They thought, let's just give away our news and we'll get more people interested in what we're doing. We're just going to give this away. But what happened was they ended up not being able to turn that off at any point. As soon as they started giving it away, uh, everybody started taking it, including in, in these um, situations you're talking about where uh, OpenAI dumped every single digitized newspaper into its largest uh, its large language model, and then now it has all that um, uh, information and journalism that have been stored up for hundreds of years uh, available to its machine to make money off, but they're never paying all those journalists and newspapers and other types of news organizations who spent enormous amounts of money to create it. You know, you have to pay people to do this type of work. You need professional journalists to do this type of work. And then these, it's, it, you know, these people are basically coming in at the last step. Imagine, for example, your paper boy, uh, the newspaper goes to the effort of making the newspaper, prints it all out. It's all done, all set and done. The paper boy drives it up to your to your doorsteps, about to hand it over to you, and somebody jumps in front of the paper boy, grabs the newspaper out, and says, uh, "I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to give this to you at ten times the price, and I get all the I get all the money. This paper boy gets nothing, the newspaper gets nothing. That's really, I mean, you think about the enormous ill-gained riches that Zuckerberg and and uh, all these tech companies have." reaped off off journalism it's just mind-blowing i mean there's some definitely responsibility on the journalism companies for giving it away but um i think i think we're starting to see some recognition that that's not a good idea for anybody and now um there's actually have been several countries that have started to restrict this uh kind of use for the large tech companies but the united states hasn't been one of them yet you know, it's uh, it's the golden goose thing, because mm -hmm. um, you know, okay, you take the content and you you, you take the hard earned product of the journalists and the newspaper and the delivery boy and all that, uh, and you sell it under your brand and you get the money. You get more money than they do. And so the golden goose is that when you when you finish doing that to them, they don't exist, and now you don't have a source of local news at all. That you can put in your local, your large language model, <laughs> you know, it is the golden goose story right there. <laughs> it's absolutely the golden goose. And then, worst of all, you're thrown into some kind of dystopian uh, fascist society at the end of it. You know, you have this beautiful uh, experiment in democracy that America has been for uh, hundreds of years, and we're going to get tossed into this, you know potentially horrific dystopian fascist state that nobody you know could even imagine before 2006 when these tech companies started coming in and strangling the goose well that's a that's a a, a process a phenomenon that's playing out or will play out in my opinion in November you know, where people are misinformed uh, they're not they're not getting enough real news so I want to talk about Ian Lind, okay? You and I were in a program a, a, a couple of years ago, and he was there as sort of the representative of the investigative reporter, the independent investigative reporter. We need people like Ian Lind, okay? And then the story about Jonathan, Jonathan Katz that you and I talked about before the show began. This is really important. Um, and uh, I am concerned, Jonathan Katz, independent reporter, you mentioned he was actually a comedian, but he was a citizen journalist. And uh, he, why don't you tell the story? Well, um, basically, the Republican uh, response to the State of the Union involved an anecdote about uh, a poor uh, child uh, involved in sex trafficking who was repeatedly raped thousands of times. And this story was framed in the response of the State of the Union as happening in the United States. Uh, during Joe Biden's watch, directly Joe Biden's fault. But 
it, none of those things were true. And this citizen journalist um, was the first one to break this story. I'm not sure. How, I'm not sure. I, I think this is the kind of story that probably uh, would have been outed, less like you know, in, in other circles. I'm not. Nece- I'm not necessarily saying it wouldn't have happened if he wouldn't have done it. But uh, it's an interesting case where. Somebody looking into this, this doesn't have to be a professional journalist at the New York Times or somebody who gets a paycheck from it, finds um, interesting uh, facts that are wrong or or some kind of maybe context or framing that's clearly misleading and then shares that information and somehow it gets a hold of um, a bigger audience. And I'd say like with Ian Lynn is, uh, I'd say he's quite a different uh, character in the sense that he is really devoted to investigative journalism and doing um, this, I, I think, full time or at least a lot of the time. Um, so there, uh, you can think about also like the George Floyd um, video that was shot when he was getting uh, strangled on the street. That was just an ordinary uh, person, not a trained journalist. She held up her phone made the video of what was happening and then shared it on her social media and that created um, the ability to tell that story. So I think there's there's a need for citizen journalists and then there's also a need for professional journalists and everybody really has the responsibility to protect democracy and operate as fair actors in that system of circulating real information, not misinformation and disinformation. And I think what has uh, happen, and this will happen more and more, I'm afraid, in the next decade uh, with AI. Is it's gonna, we're, we're going to get pummeled with misinformation and disinformation at rates that none of us have ever even imagined, like thousands and thousands of times what we imagine we'll be hit, getting hit with, and that's going to be really hard for everybody to deal with. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of Sinclair Radio, which... Uh was able with the concurrence of the Trump administration last term, um, uh, acquire 300 radio stations around the country. And, and a lot of people, they listen to radio, and they listen to Sinclair radio all around the country. And the remarkable thing come out of that is that if you went to city number one, or better yet, small town number one, and you heard the news on Sinclair radio, and then you traveled 500 miles to the east, west, north, south, uh, and listen to another completely other station of Sinclair Radio, of course, it would be exactly the same news, exactly the same slant, exactly the same opinion. Um, and so this, this, this whole notion of consolidation, I feel, is very dangerous. The other thing is, if you look at MSNBC, it's a bubble, it's a sort of democratic bubble, and you look at Fox News, it's not a democratic bubble, it's more like a Republican bubble. Um, you get you get the same news every day from all of the Democratic stations and different news from all of the Republican stations uh, on TV. And furthermore, they repeat it again, 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 again. And if you are wedded because of the bubble um, to one or the other, you, you're going to get exactly what you want to hear, but it isn't the whole story. So, and that's another kind of consolidation. There's only one MSNBC and there's only one CNN. There's only one Fox News, really, or or let me say just a few of them. Uh, We don't have the same kind of diversity that we might have had in the days of the days of better journalism. Um, To me, this is a problem that it's it's distilled, it's focused and it's repetitive. And if it's right, that's good. But if it's wrong, it's having a, a much larger effect on public opinion. Your thoughts? Yeah, the consolidation issue has been around since the mid-90s when they removed some restrictions on the Telecommunications Act of how many channels you could buy. And then uh, with the, obviously, the advent of uh, the internet and and social media and things like that, it's, uh, there, there is a, I guess there is a strong argument that there's a diversity of information out there, but uh, probably the better argument is that it's all the same. Like you said, it's like a um, amplification and reflection and um, recirculating of the same stories. If you if you watch one of those cable news stations, you know they'll have a panel on, like I said, what terrible thing did Trump say today, and then the next panel's on Trump in court, and then the next, I mean. It's, 
This is like, um, we're getting plenty of that information. I guess I, my argument would be, so what we really need for a healthy democracy is not more national information. And that's where the money's being made. That's why all these places are doing this or all these websites are doing this. We need it on what is happening in your own community. Like imagine the corruption in Hawaii right now and how much of it's going on at all times. And there's just not, there's not enough uh, guard dogs uh, around keeping track of it all. And I think I really fear that that is creating a crisis, not only in Hawaii, but all over the country in terms of accountability and um, and then the propaganda aspects, like you're saying, like, uh, you, you know, we've reached the point where people are so far into their propaganda bubbles, they, they can't even imagine a world outside the propaganda bubbles, let alone do they ever step outside of it or venture outside of it. I can't even imagine it, some people, and that is a frightening thing because that could lead to some really dangerous outcomes. I mean, we already had January sixth insurrection. What's what's the next um, what's the next step from that? One thing is, is we live in a world of press releases, and if you're not paying your reporters very much money, or you have reporters that are sort of mechanized that they don't go out and do any investigation, not even fact checking or verification. They'll, they'll take the press releases and republish the press releases. And so if I'm, if I'm Akamai about this, and certainly Donald Trump is Akamai about this, I can, I can manipulate the press by sending out these press releases or by doing other things to make them print what I want. And I think that you know, local news is, 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 is falling subject to that. Uh, it's just another part of the decline, I think. So the big question, Brett, is... What do we do? You and me care about this. We know there's a, a nexus between local news and the preservation of our democracy, our way of life, our constitution. What do we do? And it, it's got to be saved. The, the act pending in Congress is not nearly enough, even at its best. Um, <clears throat> we have got to restore the press to its former prominence, its, its former ability to positively affect public awareness. What do we do? Well, I think, first of all, we have to recognize the good efforts that are happening. Um, I'll say there, I'll, I'll start just at the student level and universities uh, nationwide. There's a uh, Center for Community News at the University of, of Vermont who has been tracking this. And they found uh, 2,000 student reporters publishing 10,000 local news stories within the last year across the country. Um, there's a big push at the university level to uh, provide a ground floor for you know uh, journalism, local journalism, and I think there have been uh, dozens of universities around the country who have stepped up. Some have even uh, bought failing little newspapers in their communities and to turn those into like student journalism labs, which I think is really, really cool and amazing. Um, so there's, there's the, uh, I think there's a support level of student journalists that can really um, help if people can like invest and, and uh, advocate for that. There's a, there's another level that's the nonprofit world of journalism. Um, uh, Honolulu has one of the best in the country called Civil Beat. Uh, it's a um, it's part of a network called the States Newsrooms, and there are 39 states that have these types of newsrooms set up. And this is these are affiliations. They're not. It's not like a um, it's not like a, a a single corporate arm or something like that. It's an affiliation of nonprofit network news and they're they're doing uh, some amazing work out there i just read um yesterday about a republican uh rally type event in kansas where the the actual leaders of the republican party in kansas thought it was a good idea to set up a one of those karate punching um figurines that people practice you know, punching in karate and put a Joe Biden face on it and have people kick it and punch it and do horrible things to it. And 
the reason that story started circulating was because of one of these um, nonprofit newsrooms called the Kansas Reflector, which I had not heard of before. They um, they were like a civil beat or like the Texas Tribune. There are a whole bunch of them around the country. They're starting to get their feed and becoming um, really well-established newsrooms that are telling their community stories. There was another one in El Paso that I ran across recently where the former editor of the El Paso Times um, started this nonprofit news organization. And so a lot of times we think like, oh, Civil Beat, well, they have a billionaire. That's pretty easy for them to get started. Um, these There are lots of examples. I don't know the story of the Kansas Reflector, but I will say I, I did read a little bit about the El Paso um, version of this. And this is an editor, just that I want to start one of these and put it together, start to get grants. And pretty soon his newsroom uh, with this nonprofit organization was bigger than the newsroom he left when he was running the daily newspaper. And I think that's um, that's part of what's developing here is a ground up student journalists, nonprofits, people who really care about their communities are starting to to establish themselves. And I think that's our future. And I would say, can we build on those? Think Tech Hawaii, like getting this kind of information out, um, letting people have these kinds of forums. This is where um, I think the future of journalism is is going to be strongest. Yeah, from your lips to God's ears. You know, I, 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 I would agree um, that nonprofit is a better model than trying to get people to pay for a print press newspaper, or people to subscribe, if you will, um, to you know, to getting an uh, electronic newsletter. Um, but I'd say that every community is on its own merits because we're talking about local news here mostly, and um, you have to raise the money locally. And it's a question of whether the community cares enough um, to spend that money. So to me, the jury is out depending on the community, uh, on, on whether you can raise sufficient money to keep a nonprofit going. But I agree, the future is in electronic, not paper, and the future is on not prof, uh, you know, nonprofit rather than, um, you know, put, put your dime on the, on, the, on, the, on the newsstand, the newsstand table. Uh, <clears throat> But what else can we do? What, how is it going at the School of Journalism? Make that the, the professional journalism program that you direct. Um, how, how is it going? Are, what kind of um, motivation do you see your students have? Are they going off and, and participating or um, you know, creating these uh, news structures? Or are, they, or are they going to do other things? Yeah, I'm happy to report that uh, in the last four years, our numbers, uh, number of majors has tripled. Uh, I mean, there's a quantitative part of that, like the numbers of majors, and then there's a qualitative. We have, I think, a really high um, commitment and engagement from our students in being these uh, journalists of the future, the the future generation of democracy coming out of uh, programs like ours and and around the country, I've heard a lot of uh, heartwarming stories about how students really see journalism as a way to uh, have a voice in in how communities turn out. I um, I think it's exciting to have we've had a partnership this uh, this semester in the last three years with Civil Beat on a project called UH Beat, where our students uh, participate in covering the legislature. And we're doing so. We're doing that again this spring, and um, this is this is similar to what uh, student journalists are doing all across the country. We've also created our own uh, website, so we're um, we're now officially the uh, operators of the Manoa Mir newsroom. <laughs> so, so talking about putting our money where our mouth is, we're like, okay, if if we we think the f the future is nonprofit student-oriented, um, uh, local journalism, then what are we going to do about it? So we created this fall a new news organization in town called the Manoa Mirror. We published um, hundreds of stories already uh, just since starting that site. And 
Um, I think it's made a big difference in the way our community, uh, particularly at UH, because we focused a lot of our coverage just on the UH campus and getting people to know about like what's happening here, and like how you know how are you going to find out what's happening at UH if you're not reading Kaleo and you're not um, looking at the Manoa Mirror. So we've made our focus on digital. Um, Breaking news. A lot of our stuff is breaking news. A lot of our a lot of our stories are just about what's happening on campus today and how can you be involved in it. So I think that's that's part of what needs to be done. I I don't want to in any way imply or, um, or or make the suggestion that we don't need investigative journalists at the highest level, investigative journalists at the medium level, and investigative journalists at the local level. We need. Those, those people need to be paid, they need to be paid well, and they need to go out and do that kind of work or the corruption will just fester and grow. But I will say that um, I think students and nonprofits can do a good job with filling in some of those blanks. And uh, I, I think we're in a really great, uh, uh, we have real great momentum right now in that, in that area. So I, I'd say, we're feeling good, we're doing good, but there's there's also gotta be this big national commitment to journalism. And that's that's the story I really want us to tell and focus on is you know, if if we don't if we don't invest in this idea of journalism as a pillar of democracy, then democracy will fall. There's no there's no denying it. This is not debatable. There are zero democracies in the world without professional journalism. Zero. So if we think the United States is going to be one of them, it's, we're not going to be one of them. There's zero, and and there, uh, you know, it's just it's just such a critical part of democracy is the circulation of trustworthy information. If you you might be able to get lots of information, but if it's all propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, uh, setting you up to turn into an unruly mob to storm the Capitol or whatever. That's not healthy for, for us, and we need to change this. And I think everybody listening to this needs to take that responsibility and do something uh, to help. Will these, uh, will these students stay here? Are there jobs for them here? What can we do to create jobs for them here? Well, the, like I said, the Civil Beat newsroom's growing. Uh, Hawaii Public Radio has been hiring a lot of our students, and um, their newsroom is growing. I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities for students to be entrepreneurs and create their own. Um, ah, there you go. Yeah, that's a great go. point. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why not? I hope somebody would take take your suggestion on that. Well, one thing is clear. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Say, I would say I'll tell you a little secret. Um, I started the Manoa Mirror with a, a web software that um, we purchased. The entire thing, the entire newsroom, basically, like every cost I have for that is about $4,000 a year. That's it. That's and great. You can make, an, you know, basically an equivalent newsroom to any anything anybody else can do, we can do it with $4,000 a year. So the <laughs> the investment's ex extremely low and all you have, but the, but the investment, I mean, the investment for that part, but then the investments in the journalism, you know, you got to hire people, get people to do the great journalism. And that's where I think like a lot of business uh, people and entrepreneurs should be looking at um, the value of trustworthy local information, the value of investigative journalism. People out there can make a lot of money and do a lot of good at the same time by investing that, I think. Yeah, make the world a better place. Uh, Brent Overgaard, the director of the journalism program at UH Manoa, thank you so much for joining us and for these very important thoughts. Aloha. Okay, thank you.